should get started. So this will be a call to order. Um, the three of us are present. Um, approval of minutes. So approval of April 20th, 2017 minutes. Second. All those in favor? And I guess with that, Tom, we'll, we'll turn it to you for your all-star lineup tonight yeah. of, of candidates that are... We do have the all-star lineup behind me. I do want to mention and beg your, uh, your indulgence, I guess, to add a couple of items to the end of the agenda so we can get through the budget review, but I'd love to give you an update, a detailed update on the proposed adjustments to the municipal budget um, and then also an update on the bond order that's on the council agenda this Wednesday, in particular the Fuel Island Replacement Project and okay. that matter was passed in first reading, but um, the consensus was to have finance kick it around, talk about it, and uh, report back to council when it comes back this week. So if time allows, I'd love to give you an update on that, too. Okay. Good. Good. So first we have police. Ms. Moulton. As they take their seats, um, my advice I've been giving the staff, and I think generally they followed it right along, <laughs> Certainly in the past, they, and they can tonight if you wish, give a presentation. I've asked them not to necessarily start with that. Um, we have a pretty good appreciation that you all have done this before and understand, understand the budget. So I think the Chief might have a couple of introductory comments and then uh, really take the conversation where you'd like it to go. Thank you very much. We always appreciate this opportunity to, to get together and uh, talk about our, our departments and our budget. And as Tom said, I, I don't have any uh, prepared speech for you. Um, I know that the night is going to be long, and, <laughs> and uh, we're, uh, we've had a pretty in-depth look last year at the line-by-line, line, and uh, not a lot has changed since then. And with some of the uh, reductions that Tom's going to talk about later, there isn't a lot of, uh, uh, from my perspective, there isn't a whole lot to talk about, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll go through any uh, any sections that you want. Um, however you want to do this is I'm certainly willing to do it however you wish. Okay, great. Um, so with that, do you want to just kind of, yeah, I'm sure, Chris, I'm sure you have some questions that uh, float to mind? Um, you know, actually, honestly, not, not so much, you know, budget related, more just follow up from what we talked about last year about, you know, status of Operation Hope, what are we looking at for you know, community policing needs, that kind of stuff. You sure. Know, are, are we there? You know, not so much, you know, numbers and bolt numbers and dollars and cents at this point. Just sure. We're making progress. Are we are we setting ourselves up for challenge? How are the new two officers working out? I hope that's working well. Well, um, <laughs> we haven't uh, we haven't actually seen the effects of those two new officers because we had a couple people leave, so we've been in transition. And uh, we're in the process of doing that now. We expect to be up and running soon. Um, so I, I can't report on how effective that's been at this point, but I can tell you that were it not for the fact that we had those two positions, we would be down below where we were strength last year. So at least even with people leaving, we've been able to maintain what would have been our, our full staffing. So that's been helpful. Um, as far as Operation Hope, we're at uh, 245 uh, folks that we've placed in treatment. Um, we're it's it's going. It's uh, it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's uh, sometimes there's a lot of folks coming in, and sometimes there isn't. What has happened though is is that. Um, We've kind of been overwhelmed in the sense we, uh, John Gill uh, took a job as a detective down in Biddeford, and uh, so uh, Jamie is really pulling the load, and, and I've been involved in a number of um, you know, speaking engagements and talking to legislators and that type of thing. So it's, it, it, we need some help, but where we need the help right at this moment is not so much the monies. Uh, for the folks to, to send the folks to treatment and travel. We're, we're pretty good on that right at this point. What we do need is somebody to manage the thing and also to be able to do, have the time to look back and see what our successes have been and also look forward and see what a package moving forward looks like that can get us out of this business. Because we've always felt that this is not sustainable in the long term and that's not what we intended. It's, it's essentially a band-aid on a hemorrhage and we're, we need a more comprehensive program to come along, but we don't feel like 
um, we recognize that a lot of legislators want to want to help and want to do something, but I think collectively it's hard for them to understand what that looks like. And we were hoping that if we could get somebody in place, we could help shape what that might look like and make the transition from a local program to something that could go statewide. So to that end, there is a federal, uh, federal grant uh, available, and we have applied for it as of last Tuesday. It would... Um, it would cover a person for three years with no match, um, and uh, that would give us that opportunity to, to move it forward and see if we couldn't come up with some a better solution and also take, uh, take um, Jamie would still be involved at some point, so, so would I, but not to the extent that we are right now. It's kind of overwhelming at this point. Are you seeing any other programs coming online regionally? I mean, I, I keep hearing the news every so often, another town will start up something, or I, Portland, I think, was trying to do something as well. Yep, there are um, there are a few other places that have contacted us and have started programs that basically are mirrors of our program. Um, I don't think that they're handling the numbers of folks that we have been, um, but they there are in place in Ellsworth, uh, Waterville. There's a, a few scattered around, and then there are other initiatives. Um, Portland has an initiative where they have hired um, a, a person, a liaison type person who is. Um, taking recommendations, I believe, from uh, from officers that uh, identify folks that might need help, and then they're trying to work with those folks. Uh, Westbrook is doing something similar to that, um, but there ha there needs to be a, a a statewide or a regional program that brings all of that together, and that's just not happening at this point. Just if I could, on the uh, federal grant, I, I did credit uh, the chief and his senior staff in putting that application together. Time didn't allow for us to kind of bring and make a presentation to council, but should we be successful, there would have to ex officially accept it. And our intent would be, if we should be so lucky, is to come with a full-blown presentation and so you can appreciate uh, all the benefits of that program and hopefully uh, agree to accept it. And I might add that uh, uh, give some kudos to our VIP program. We have a um, VIP, Duncan Perry, who's been uh, very helpful in doing the research and helping put together uh, that grant because it was very complicated and lengthy and, and uh, Deputy Chief Grover oversaw that, but got some assistance from, uh, from Duncan and also from uh, a lady that works uh, with Project Grace on, on some of these things. So we're fortunate to be able to even be able to put it together. We have got great support from uh, a number of different agencies as well as uh, Senator King's office and Senator Collins' office and a bunch of other folks. So we're hopeful. But there's only 45 awards going out across the country, so we can't be too hopeful. Mm -hmm. Great quick question for you. Sort of the per at least it's, it's sort of in my, in my list every year. So. This was the first year of sort of parking meters at Higgins Beach. Mm -hmm. How much how much payroll is in the budget now for Higgins Beach patrolling during the off season? Is it a sizable number? I, I think I was recalling north of sixty thousand a year or something like that. No, I don't believe it's sixty thousand. We have um, it's a boat. I can find it exactly, but it's uh, in the area of thirty-five thousand, and that's uh, oh, all in thirty-five thousand. All in is thirty-five thousand. Pine Point is around. Um, 10,000, 11,000, something like that. You may, the, the 60,000 number that you uh, speak of may be a combination of all of it because we had 10 or 11,000 dollars at Pine Point. We had, I believe, 35 at Higgins Beach. Then uh, we did have Enhanced Beach Patrol, which was an officer that was bouncing from all of the different beaches. So combined, that could have very well been 60,000. Yeah, the, the uh, the enhanced was 9,300. 9, the uh, Pine Point was 10, just over 10,000, 10,315. And then Higgins Beach is at 38,4. And were there any significant issues down there last year with, with that presence? I mean, was there, did you feel there was a need for that kind of presence all the time at Higgins Beach as compared to, as you said, Pine Point and, and others? It's a more congested community and um, the problems that do arise are, are 
right in the face of residents down there, so it's it's more visible. It, uh, I'm not going to say there were significant issues, but what issues there are are, are you, pretty are you, visible to that small community. Are you noticing, like, let's say, a decrease in calls? Let's say because the, the, you get an officer mm -hmm. present there anyway, so you're not seeing as much come through dispatch, or or is it pretty much remain constant? I think we're probably pretty constant in terms of what we get for, for calls down there. Um, we certainly do have the presence and they are taking care of things and some people are going directly to to the officers. We actually uh, set up a communication system last year so that uh, the folks from the Higgins Beach Committee could reach out directly to the officer um, and that probably saved some communications through dispatch. But in terms of the number of, but those are more calls about different things that they were seeing. It weren't necessarily uh, um, calls that would come in to dispatch to, for a call for service. Okay. Can you distinguish though, maybe take us back a little bit, so Prout's Net, yeah. you know, actually pays in some additional funds Correct. as a community to be able to have a greater police presence. Correct. Um, how did that come to be and, and how is that either alike or distinctly different than Higgins Beach? I mean, Higgins Beach has an association also. Mm -hmm. And so how did we determine that for Prout's Net it was appropriate to ask for some funding to help with the cost versus not for Higgins Beach. Um, believe it or not, this comes before my time. But <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, good answer, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I can tell you that my understanding is that um, Prout's Neck had come forward as an association and asked for increased coverage and there just weren't the resources to do that and they really uh, wanted to see that. So they entered in an agreement um, with whoever was town manager at the time and um, they worked this thing out and uh, it started, I'm going to say it was in place probably in the 60s. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's had some revisions. It was originally it was um, we had we would have retired officers that would go down there and Prouts Neck would pay them directly and so forth and then um, as time went on and things changed and we wanted to have a little more transparency and so forth uh, that changed and so they were we were paying and and working with them to decide who would be down there and and then they would reimburse but it's it's a system that's been in place for a long long while and there's no I can't tell you exactly what the how it started, but my understanding was they just didn't feel like they could. They they wanted more service than the town was able to provide. What portion? A significant portion of that is privately owned. I mean, the beach is privately owned, correct? The, I think they call that West Beach. West yeah, Western, Western Beach. Yeah. Western Beach is privately owned, and they monitor that as well as the private roads that go in the gated community. Yes. So I think the significant difference is the ownership of the. What they're actually monitoring or what they're actually patrolling outside of the Black Point Road, which is obviously public, everything else is private. And I, I, frankly, I think the residents of the association is equally interested in kind of the off-season oversight. Uh, that place, mm -hmm. there's not many um, year-round residents uh, mm -hmm. down on the neck, so except for football season, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, so I, I think that's equally important for them to make sure that there's a constant presence yeah. or kind of a security presence uh, mm -hmm. than you know, enforcing laws of the. Um, can you touch us a little bit about both your, your capital? I mean, as we take a look at this budget cycle, which is sure. tough, and yep. next Absolutely. year is probably going to be equally as tough. Absolutely. I mean, the other thing we're starting to pay some attention to is what, what's on sort of the capital plan, because it's not in the numbers this year per se if it's bonded, but it will be in debt service sure. next year and the year after, which, which we're looking at. Sure. And just two items I had specific questions on. One, you, you, sorry. Uh, uh, tab. Uh, it's tab six, I think. Tab Is six, it? page three. Okay. Thank you. And so it looks like you have an animal control officer vehicle replacement on the on the list. That has been pushed out. That has been pushed out. Okay. Yes. I didn't know that. Okay. Great. And then that, the other one. That vehicle, uh, the, the manager had called him and asked if uh, if we could survive if that got pushed out. Great. It's got a. It's, it's surprising how many miles it's got on. I think it's got 150,000 miles, but um, it's in uh, pretty decent shape, yeah, and so we think we can. Up close and personal. Uh, up close right? and personal. <laughs> <laughs> I got to let the town know my dog passed away. <laughs> <laughs> that was on his list. <laughs> so, so that did uh, the manager did move that out of here. And the traffic monitoring camera. That 
That, that's a request from um, Donnie Mitchell. Uh, it's more, really more of a the town electrician traffic control. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was saying to the deputies earlier, um, I, I don't want people to think that that is cameras for enforcement at our intersection because that's not what it is at all. It's, it's something that Donnie uh, needs for the intersections to the cameras view the traffic lines and help him regulate the traffic flow and so forth. But the cameras actually detect, see what's, what traffic is in the queue and will uh, cycle the light uh, accordingly. That's the door technology. Really? Yeah. So are they used at all for, you know, obviously accidents or something to go back and you can review tickets and see what happens there, right? Or, or is that, and they're not even used for that, really? I don't, I don't believe so. No, I don't think there's any recording or anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's another purpose. It doesn't the, the, record it, but it will allow dispatch to look at a crash mm -hmm. that's ongoing at an intersection, and the dispatch will be able to verify whether operators are out walking around or if we have entrapment, gotcha. um, yeah. that sort of thing. Okay. So it's like the cameras are for our two major intersections, Dunstan and Oak Hill, and it's, hopefully it'll help improve safety at these intersections. And if for some reason, um, you know, somebody was looking for a vehicle or something like that, it may be helpful to us to be able to look at that intersection and, and watch for a particular vehicle or something. But it's not what people would normally think about an intersection camera that's going to take pictures of people running red lights or whatever. Or speeding. It's not going to So are that. these, do you know if these two cameras are, are for, are they uh, for new intersections or are they just replacements for existing? I don't believe there are. Cam I don't believe they have any now. I think okay. these are new. And this was Oak Hill and Dunstan. Yes. Oak Hill and Dunstan. Dunstan yeah. The two majors. These are not replacements, right? Yeah. No, they do not replace. This is brand this new. Is, um, new equipment that Mr. Mitchell recommended because we have fiber optics, um, the fiber at these two intersections already, um, and he recommended it as an enhancement yeah. for public safety as well as for him. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll be moving to having one at every intersection on Route 1? I don't foresee that because of the volume of the other intersections, the traffic volume. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it would make financial sense to, to do some of the other intersections along Route 1. And, and I'm not sure that we have fiber at all those locations either. But oh, okay. We could, yeah. but I'm not aware of that. So, so as more for the, I think for the town manager, I know from the Transportation Committee we talked about um, doing an audit of, of infrastructure in town, this I would assume be, would be included in something similar to that, and do more of a comprehensive traffic plan with PACs because there's, I guess, parts of Route 1 that they have to buy into that we don't control and there's other parts that we have to do timing. So, so is this something that could tie into that bigger picture or is this something that, that is? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Essentially, the route, entirety of Route 1 is integrated. It, it is a traffic management system. <coughs> so they are communicating and coordinated with each other. Uh, and long stretches of Payne Road uh, into South Portland are as well, actually, all the way to Portland, I think. So we cooperate on a, on a traffic management system. Uh, I wasn't aware of an inventory, but I think that's a terrific idea. I'm just sure we know what we have. So I'm just wondering if it, if it makes sense, if it's, unless it's a safety issue that needs to happen right away, is that something that maybe we uh, look at to, as part of that comprehensive plan so that I, I think one of the things that we talked about in transportation was having continuity through the whole system because right now I think it's a, it sounds like it's a little piecemeal as something fails that's when we go and replace and I think they're looking at trying to get a handle on maybe homogenizing the system a little bit for lack of a better word so I, and again I, I mean it's not it's not huge money at all um, I just uh, you know, I would just like to see if we're going to, you know, kind of like what we're trying to do is come back and do more of a systemic approach um, to the to the overall planning. Um, unless it's something that, I mean, if you feel it's a safety issue that has to happen right away, then obviously that's going to take precedent. I don't have a problem with that. But I guess I'd, I'd feel differently if they were replacements that suggest to me that they're necessary, that these are enhancements. Uh, I can't sit here and say that we can't live another year without them. I think the people of Skyrim would love to have cameras at every one of the intersections on Route 1 based upon the traffic violations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally serious. If they, if they wrote tickets, yeah. Totally serious. Yeah. No, there's, there's lots of... And wasn't there, a wasn't there a rollover at the main med, uh, in front of, uh, not main med, uh, <coughs> uh, the old Kmart. I can't think what's there now. Yeah, it's main the med. It's main, main med. Main med. Yeah, yeah. Main med. yeah. yeah there was a t I mean, it's just dangerous on Route 1. It is. We will... Um,
our school resource officers will be coming out of the schools here shortly and we'll be plugging them into the patrol schedule and putting some folks out uh, to specifically to deal with traffic enforcement. Mm -hmm. But, but Chris, I, if I, when you're suggesting, could that be pushed out? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, well, I, I, maybe not even just, you know, uh, yes, if it could be pushed out, great, until we get a kind of more of a comprehensive study to see, because I think, you know, I think it's, you know, we've, you know, to nobody's necessarily fault, we've been kind of piecemealing this stuff as things come up, and, um, and we may not, I don't know, again, I'm looking to the manager, I don't know if we even have anything in a proposed, I don't think, for, for um, planning, for the study, I don't know if that's something that's going to be proposed or it's going to be through PACs or something. Yeah, so, I'm not aware um, of a project like that. But right. It certainly sounds appropriate. Yeah, I don't think it's going to come to site this budget cycle, which is what I'm saying. Right. I think it's right. probably something okay. gearing up for next. But again, if it's a safety issue and we need it, okay, I, I get that. But if not, and we think we could put it off, it might be better off. Yeah. Consider it. Yeah. I know. Okay. Great. I only have actually one comment, and it's more of long range than it is about mm -hmm. this year's budget. So I think last year was the second year of a two-stage approach to your staffing model and, and bringing up uh, more officers or bringing them to full time. Do you see your model being able to sustain our current because of our current position and knowing where we're going to be for the next couple of years without any major changes to the model, or are you expecting any future changes to that model that we need to consider? I mean, we're, st we're trying to move from this uh, line item budget year to year kind of mm -hmm. approach and you and the fire department both have kind of gotten your models to a, an agreeable point last year understanding where we're going and I just want to be sure that we're kind of uh, we have that same agreement or that understanding that the models will survive over the next couple of years and wanted to kind of you know hear from you that that is sustainable over the next couple of years. I think it is. Um, as we said earlier, we haven't uh, really had the chance to really experience the additional two officers, and I think that's going to be a significant help to us. Um, our calls for service continue to grow, to, uh, to, you know, more businesses and, and uh, homes are coming to town, and we'll always, probably as that grows, we'll always see uh, more need, but I don't see anything significant right, uh, right at the moment. Has, any, has anything changed with respect to the topic around um, overusers uh, of services uh, where we're, um, without mentioning company names, sure. and, you, know, sure. you, you know where I'm going with that and sure. you know, how that's being handled from a, a kind of an, a perceived abuse perspective? Yeah, I mean, I've read uh, certain, uh, certainly articles yeah. from around the country that deal with it in different ways. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I don't, feel like that would be my my call. Uh, that's, to me, that's a public policy decision. That I would be certainly happy to sit down and workshop about it, um, but um, I don't, I'm not proposing any change at no, this no. point. I didn't know if you've seen any statewide trends regarding that or if there's any regional, uh, you know, considerations that we could take into consideration that you've seen. Are you talking about businesses, Sean, mostly? Um, well, I mean, Bang uh, well, I'm just thinking City of Bangor um, addressed this from an individual resident perspective versus a business. Yeah. Yeah. Here we have several businesses that are over users, um, not necessarily because it's their fault, but um, so, so it's not really, it's for anybody, whether it's the individual household or whether it's a business. To me, yeah. it's the same. The simplest example would be the fire alarms, you know, with the chronic right. abusers of that. And essentially the way we address that is through fines and penalties. You know, you get so many free, and then if it's subsequent ones, there's, there's cost. And it's amazing how behaviors change. <laughs> so for existing businesses, I would suspect we'd have to approach it much like uh, similar, you know, that it's a nuisance. Then the challenge would be to quantify the impact and find mm. a way to through fines and penalties, because I don't know of a way to retroactively reach back to an existing business. Uh, now, conversely, it's, uh, there's the potential of putting in impact, uh, impact That's right, I suppose, I for, for future businesses, um, not unlike we have for school and traffic and other things. Mm -hmm. but, uh, for that to be effective, you'd need to quantify the <coughs> impact, and the fees would need to resemble those costs. And it might even get more ticklish because typically those are for capital expenses, not for ongoing operational costs. Yeah. So it's a delicate area for sure. Um, interestingly, going through the uh, police building, uh, public safety building process, there's been a, a fair degree of kind of forward thinking. And Councillor Hayes has been part of that process in terms of what the needs of the department are over the next 20 and 25 mm -hmm. and maybe further out than that. Uh, 
for obvious reasons, make sure we build a building that either can accommodate that need now or in the future. The other thing I would just note is the comprehensive plan might give us some hint um, as to development patterns uh, in town. This is probably a conversation that ought to be part of that uh, impact, in the impact fees, or fees, but impact conversation of development. Uh, what types do we want? Where do we want it? Uh, those sorts of things. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's striking. We started this conversation last year, um, and I, I don't know where it, it, it I don't. I know I didn't take it anywhere after that. Um, I don't know if that's something that, I mean, would that be more ordinance with planning, or was that, uh, would that be, you know, long-range planning? I mean, where would we, where, where would we initiate that process through? Because, I mean, I do think it's worth at least looking at and coming up with some different options, especially if it's, if it's <coughs> continues to tax our resources in, in a way that's disproportionate. And that was kind of my concern is we're, you know, if we can come up with a, a reasonable fix and talking to, to the former town planner, um, yeah, I know there was some concerns about it's got to be equitable, it's got to be it's got to be justifiable, and has to you know, obviously pass the straight face test. Um, you know, and, and can we is it a fee retroactive? How do we do it? But I think it would I certainly think it would look at it would benefit us to look at it a little bit more. I don't know where we should put that. Uh, I mean, Honestly, I think the comprehensive comprehensive plan process would be a, a great opportunity to understand land use patterns and mm -hmm. zoning. You can dictate what goes where essentially, mm -hmm. and it's predominantly big, big box retailers that are uh, a real noticeable challenge on us, and we have control as to what else comes here, frankly. So mm -hmm. that might be a better way to address it. Just mm -hmm. land use. You know, and I think, I think, Chris, I think last year the rules and policy was Will, John, and I, and that was one of the last agenda items yeah. that we had, is to start maybe thinking about impact fees globally, mm -hmm. really driven by part of this, and I don't know where that work has gone, but it, it's a great suggestion. We really, last year we talked about it, this year it really should be on one of our committee's work lists or whatever yeah. to take a look at. Yeah. That's right. We have, we have made some adjustments um, in how we process some of the things to try to um, minimize to the extent that we can, but the bottom line is we have no control over how, how often they call or... Um, and they don't even understand. They don't necessarily... It, 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 that's true. That's true. Last year, it's like 25 of the... It takes one whole officer pretty much. Yes. You know, just yeah. to deal with the big box stores. That's a lot of resources. That was, I think that was only the top three of, I think that was only the top three of them would take up a full person. Yeah. Um, everybody good? I'm good. All set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Chief Moulton, I really didn't prepare any formal comments either based on Tom's guidance. Yeah, I did guidance. <laughs> <laughs> he was after me on the agenda and he said to be careful about who's following you. So <laughs> that hint was easy enough to take. Um, I guess I, I will just say that um, there have been a number of changes since the budget was published. Um, one of them was in the original um, draft of the budget. There was a $289,924 cut to the full-time staffing that we had proposed in accordance with the staffing plan that we have been working on since 2003. Um, I certainly understood the manager's reasons this year when we looked at the bottom line and um, there is some information in one of the appendixes to the budget that explains the rationale and, and some of the um, reasons for that. I, I guess what I'd like to say is that we would really appreciate an opportunity to sit down in workshop session outside of the budget process this summer or fall. Um, one of the things that I had planned to do for this budget process this year was uh, an update of that staffing plan. Um, some of the guidance that Tom has given me over the years is 
we really need to be able to see what the end game is for this. And I think that is important, and we've worked real hard, and, and I think we do have a plan that I'm very interested in getting your feedback on. So I did not prepare it as part of this, knowing that it wasn't going to survive, and I didn't want to <laughs> take time at this juncture, but I really would like to get on the schedule for uh, probably sometime later this fall to really look at this in depth and, and uh, explain where we're at and where we see we need to be. Right. The chief's described as almost a recalibration of that plan. I mean, I'm certain some of the central themes and elements will survive, but it's it's really a, a new look of a different, slightly different approach to meeting those future needs. Uh, so I, I guess I, I just one kind of general question. Last year, when we authorized new positions, it, it changed the structure of the department. Um, I'd just like to get a little feedback on how that's progressing and has it made a positive impact or are we still in transition or where do we get an update no, kind of it, on that It program? made a really a, a great positive uh, difference. We were able to institute a new officer's position, so now we've got a full-time officer on duty at the Dunstan Station, which has helped with that span of control of folks over there. The duty officer is now over at Oak Hill, and at some point, if we're fortunate enough to get a public safety building, that, that will really pay off in spades um, because right now we have a limited number of folks at that facility even though it's our busiest facility we just don't have the space for uh, them to spend the night so mm -hmm. when we're able to get a handful of uh, students in there and uh, make progress with another facility that that will really help but it, it's had a very positive impact one of the other things that we've seen this year is our calls for service for our third ambulance, we, we have two that we staff, and mm -hmm. then we have a third one that is our spare, and we use that to fill in when one needs maintenance, and we use it for concurrent calls or for calls that require more than one ambulance. And, and we're just seeing the use of that third ambulance skyrocket from um, what it had been in previous years, and that additional staffing at Dunstan has helped us with that. It's just that the calls are continuing to increase and a lot of them are coming at the same time so that we're running in three different directions and that helped from a revenue perspective too because every one of those that we can handle ourselves with that third unit is revenue that comes in versus an out-of-town mutual aid rescue that comes in and gathers that revenue to boot. In general, does, does the ambulance revenue cover ambulance expenses in general? It does not, no. It's, it's it. What, what's sort of the loss ratio? Is it? <coughs> I think, okay. Yeah, it's probably between 30 and 40 percent of, of the EMS budget, but it's it's hard to say that because our EMS folks that are in that budget are also trained firefighters, so right. they do the work in both directions. Um, but we bring in in revenues the EMS budget this year, just to give you the numbers. We're proposing $850,000 go into the general fund. Now, that doesn't mean that's all we collect. We collect more than that, and that goes into a dedicated revenue fund. From that, we fund purchases of new ambulances and other high-tech equipment for the EMS service. So this particular year, one of our CIP um, requests is to reach ASSE and ambulance. That will come out of that fund. But 850000 is going towards the general fund to offset the cost of EMS service, and the EMS budget um, is about $1.8 So, so is, there, is, there any, is there any flexibility in pushing those fees, the ambulance fees? The insurers are paying pretty much any, at least every time I get my bill from <laughs> medical providers, there doesn't seem to be. Our, is, is there any ability to... Our fees, are, those? Yeah, our fees are tied to the Medicare rate, so we adjust it automatically when Medicare changes theirs, and our fees, our the insurance that pays for our clients' services, we're about almost 50% Medicare or Medicaid. So Medicare is paying, I think it's 43 or 44% of the claims that we submit. But do you charge, I mean, that, that's interesting, because usually Medicare fee schedules, like the hospitals and providers, pay about 60 cents on the dollar. So if Medicare is paying 60 cents, any commercial pay, and I gotta believe you must have some commercial pay in the mix, is usually 
you know, if, if, if Medicare is paying 60 cents on the dollar, commercial market's paying a buck. Do we have a different fee schedule for commercial versus? We can't legally charge a different fee schedule, but uh, we, ha we are priced beyond the Medicare rate, and we do get more from the private insurance carriers. Oh, so you can, I mean, sort of like the hospital, you can still charge a Correct. retail price. You're not going to get any more money from Medicare. Correct. And so the that retail price that you pay, is there any room to push that on the 50% that's commercial? There is. We, we adjust it rather than shoot from the hip. We try to figure out what our cost is. We charge that rate. Medicare automatically bumps it down to what they figure it's worth, which is 50 to 60 cents on the dollar. So why, why, I guess my question is, so why would we want to charge a market rate? Because a lot of times the medical providers, what they're charging you is not their cost. I mean, when an MRI down the street here costs 2,500 bucks, I mean, is there, so I'm just saying, as we struggle with revenue sources and to find ways to sustain ourselves, <coughs> is there any ability to charge what our cost is plus a 20% markup? Today? And we try not to do that, A, because the thing that we're forgetting here is that there are private payers involved. There's folks that don't have insurance or have to meet their deductibles and co-pays, and when they don't have that coverage, that comes out of their pocket. So if you're with... Anthem, for example, you may have a great coverage, but if you haven't met your deductible yet, that $1,500 bill comes out of your hide, and that um, creates a problem for us. We've got tax base. The philosophical way that we've always done this is your taxes provide a service. Everybody is entitled to protection. That's one of the things that communities do. Beyond that, we try to recoup what we can from the insurance that most everybody has so that the users of the service contribute as well, if not more than the average taxpayer. We, we, we get a lot of gruff from folks who are citizens who get a bill yeah. and it's their beginning of the year, they haven't met their co-pays or their deductibles yet, saying, I can't believe I got a thousand dollar bill and you know, I'm paying I'm a taxpayer and you shouldn't be sending me to collections and all that stuff. So it's it's not as simple as what you're saying. We've tried to find that fine line between charging what it's costing theoretically. If everybody was paying hundred percent, this is what the rate is to cover our cost. The trouble is we're not getting that from fifty percent of our Claims. So, so just a question. So if, if Northeast Ambulance is private, right? Mm -hmm. Have we ever benchmarked what Northeast Ambulance is charging for a call versus what we charge? Well, they're not really doing the same type of call. They're doing private Trans duty um, non-emergency transports, which is a whole different yep. classification. Then, then maybe they're not the right. There are some commercial for-profit ambulance services out there. Have we ever benchmarked what their for light calls, what that fee schedule is versus ours. I can certainly do that. I, I'd just be curious because I mean, there's, there's always a mechanism by which we can forgive, I would guess, for those people that have needs. You know, we wouldn't take them to court. We wouldn't try to collect. But I'm just saying as we struggle with revenues, I mean, it's 70% of, I mean, a lot of your calls are the ER calls, right? The emergency vehicle calls. I mean, it, it increased over time, the well, number of fire calls versus I guess that's, that's, maybe that's a question you can answer, Chief, is that, you know, you said the ambulance calls are going up. Can you describe maybe the nature of those calls? Are they more, for lack of a better word, kind of, you know, nursing home calls, or are they actual, you know, uh, accident calls, motor vehicle accidents? Is it a lot more trauma type stuff, or is it a lot of, what, what's the nature of that increase in generally? Well, the types of calls run the gamut, but essentially they all fall into, and our fee schedules are set up in a couple of different classifications. So a basic life support call, an advanced life support call, and then they have what they call an advanced life support too. So a cardiac arrest that requires a bunch of drugs and yep. defibrillation and the full <clears throat> boat yep. is billed at that higher rate. Yep. We get a variety of different calls. Um, I don't have in front of me what the exact breakdown is. Um, just, yeah, just, I'm just looking for a general thing. I mean, if we're seeing more... You know a third I mean? to third to third, I okay. think, is probably somewhere in the ballpark okay. between those three different types. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing that we're working with the legislature, and I, I've talked to you, I think, about community paramedic in the, in the past, we've got a grant, we trained a bunch of folks to the paramedic level, the community paramedic level, so that we can start doing um, some in-home care or some uh, treat and release or treat and refer. 
Right now, the only way we get paid is if we transport somebody to the hospital, and that's the way state law is is written. We don't have the option to take them to a quick care, an urgent care, a PCP's office. We have one choice: use the most expensive transport mode, an ambulance with an advanced paramedic on it, to take them to the most expensive place to get treatment, the emergency room at Maine Medical Center. And that's what we're trying to change with legislation. There's legislation pending now to get Medicare, Maine Care to reimburse, because um, there's a number of different calls that we go on where our folks are more than adequately trained. Yeah. Somebody has a diabetic emergency, we give them a little bit of sugar, they come out of it, they've got a history, they know how to handle it, they just had a mishap, uh, and we leave them home. But we don't get reimbursed for that, uh, but a very small fraction of the time. Back to Peter's original inquiry around, um, I'm just trying to think, in order to do a, a proper comparison, you really would need to find a for-profit ambulatory care provider that services a community, not just a for-profit ambulatory care company. Cause, right. And I can't think of anybody that uses a, pro maybe, does Lewiston for Delta Ambulance? They're the only ones that, but because everyone has, that, I mean, that's the issue about yeah. regionalization services, regional services, is that everyone has their own, uh, yeah. primarily a fire department with ambulatory services. In so Maine, that's the main thing. In, in yeah. other parts of the country, the costs are different than they are for us. So it, it is a little tricky to come up with those comparisons, but I certainly don't mind putting some effort into it. I'd mean, I, I just be curious what, yeah. if there's any potential, I mean, as we look at the choices that are in front of us mm -hmm. going forward, if there's any way that you can push the fee schedules higher, knowing that Medicare is not going to pay you anymore, and yes, there are going to be people that are impacted because of deductibles and co-pays, I understand that, but a lot of the commercial payers that are paying are, are getting a break, maybe. So if there's any, it'd just be nice to know whether there's any, in the 800,000 revenue on 1.5 expense, just like we're asking, if there's any way we can get closer to a break even, no, point that just helps all taxpayers and it tries to get the cost more aligned with who are using the services. If that's at all possible, it'd be a worthwhile project, I think, because we're mm -hmm. going to have to find alternative revenue sources going forward other than taxpayers, and I think that's where we are. That's a fair question. Yep. Chief, just to, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, thing, but um, Narcan. Is that in this budget? Is that something I know the district attorney had get, or the attorney general had sent some out? I know that doesn't last forever. Um, is that coming, are you splitting the budget? Or is that coming to you or is that, is that not recovered this year? Or, uh, where, where are we with that? So the, if, and the police chief can correct me if I'm wrong, but the attorney general's uh, office provided uh, grant funding for the Narcan of the police officers yep. carry. I think they carried two units in each patrol unit. And we carry them, uh, units in our ambulances uh, and in the distant engine companies. We also carry Narcan. Those, like every medication, have an expiration date. You see in the budget this year that we've been, uh, outside of that reason, uh, sort of forced into uh, purchasing our own medications. Mm -hmm. For as long as I've been here, the hospitals have covered that cost and mm -hmm. now it's shifted to us. So I think there's a six or $7,000 figure in it and that would obviously include replacement Narcan as well. Okay. Okay, so that's included in that in that medication overall medication for us, yes. Okay. So does that lead into when I looked at supplies overall going up twenty percent or thirty thousand? Is that is that part of that? So what happened in last year was that July one of sixteen we put all of what they call the soft goods that we usually replace at the hospitals, IV catheters, tubing, IV yep. supplies, yep. nasal all that stuff. They stopped that last year. Okay. So the problem with that last year was we had no way to really track that, so we had no idea what uh, that number was going to look like, and we, through experience, now know what that number is going to look like. The medications is a little easier to predict because we actually this database built in to hone that down. So that number hopefully will be a lot more accurate. Can you buy from the hospital so you get their discounted yep. prices, or yep. oh, but they probably still yep. charge you? No, but that's They're going to right. negotiate as part of this new yeah. process is bulk purchasing and, and passing those costs along to us, as well as things like, you know, when expirations come up, as long as we get it back to them 30 days before they expire, the hospitals will reuse them because they use it as much quicker much than quicker we do there. and replace it for no charge. So it's a new cost. It certainly is a new way of doing business. This year was the big change, as Tony mentioned, because, you know, all those soft goods, bandages, mm -hmm. IV tubing, just a wealth of stuff that 
we never thought of. We walked in, we took it off the shelf, and, and there was never any tracking or inventory to worry about. They always paid for it. And that was a eye-opener. We're well over budget in this current year, and mm -hmm. we've made that adjustment so that we've covered the cost. So quick access. question. So do you, do you, on calls then, when patients are using those supplies, do they get billed, or is it just built into? You, is you that you a three fee structure? Years yeah. ago, three fee structure. Yeah. Years ago, it used to be a la carte. We yep. used to bill for different mm -hmm. services. Now it's built into those three tiers, and that's really driven well, by the Medicaid. Price. It's one price, price, no matter what they do. But the advanced life support higher rate envisions that you're going to use a couple of different uh -huh. drugs and X amount of supplies. That's why it's a higher rate. Uh -huh. But it's 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 bundled in those tiers to meet the Medicare regulations. I, I just I just want to be careful because this is a very slippery slope. Um, I know if I'm if I'm tacking out, I don't want them to ask for my credit card. <laughs> yeah, well, no. <laughs> and, and, I, and I certainly don't want them to run it first before they trade. <laughs> before they put in the, well, the hospitals don't do that. They just run the bill and yeah, well, take yeah, it six well, months later. Yeah, thank yeah. God the Thomas yeah. agency. They're going to stabilize me first before I have another heart attack when I go to the hospital and see the bill. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, quick, quick question. For just, when I look on page 58 and then on page 61, on both of those pages, you make reference to some additional part-time hour. Are they are they two separate items, or is it just the same item? And as I think that's already been adjusted, maybe out of a. There were two additional staffing positions that I had put forward, and in the last round of Tom's requested curtailments, those have both been eliminated. One was a fire prevention intern position. Um, with the it was eight hours a week to help out with all the new development coming. That ended up being a little over $9,000 cut, um, including the FICA Medicare that went with it. In the EMS budget, there was a little over 13000 which was an EMS billing clerk. Uh, I will tell you up front that I think that's not well advised to, to make that cut. I did it because it was new personnel, and I knew that that's where you folks were thinking. I will tell you that I, I am confident that that EMS billing clerk will more than pay for themselves with additional revenue. We did a pilot program just with the finance um, folks that don't have the dedicated time to do this. And in a seven month period, she generated $20,000 in between customers at the counter. If I had somebody there 20 hours a week, I, I know that we could uh, do better with revenues and I have forecasts of increased revenues um, because of this. Sure. I, out of curiosity, would that be something we could we use one of the student uh, trainees for that as part of their training, or could, is there a the coding, is, the coding itself on those? Is pretty yeah. Well, I know. I'm just saying. I mean, it's part of the. You know, the eventually, they're going to learn the codes. They got to know the all that stuff anyway. I would think. I don't know if that's just a way to, you know, try and at least get the slot filled at a lower price level. And I, I, I know you got to train that person every single time, and that person might not be there for a long period. But yeah. um, I don't know if that's something to at least. Recoup some of that, maybe. I, I don't know. Just a thought. Okay. Just a thought. And then, so those, th that, I think that answered the question on those two part time positions. Have been, at least, in they have been covered. Yeah, with Thompson Grower. Okay. Yeah. Anything on? Yep. On capital improvements, just to, again, Tom Sport, I talked to you about this, and I don't know what's, what's in or what's out at this point, because I know adjustments have been made. Um, you know, I, I think you've talked a little bit about the rescue unit. That's That's in that fund balance you, you talk about and you've got to schedule for it. But other things you have here, you've got a you've got a replacement staff vehicles and donate donation funded equipment initiatives. Any and both of those well I guess the donation fund is the reserve. But the replacement staff vehicles, any chance that can be staggered, pushed out a year or anything to kind of get that off the next year's debt service? Yep. There's six projects. Two out of the six are funded from the reserve accounts, the Rescue Reach ASC, and the one that goes with that is the power structures that needs to be done at the same time. Yep. That is scheduled to be bonded. So that is one that, um, although it's not all coming out of that rescue revenue account, it is part and part, part of the same of project. The, same yep. project. Yep. the um, staff vehicle, Tom and I did look at that. If you look at our replacement schedule, we've got stuff programmed every year, and it's based on years and mileage and everything else. But there really is no space to plug that without moving everything back four or five years. So it's will it survive another year? Yes. It will negatively impact that replacement program downstream for another four or five years. 
Are, are you selling the equipment that we're disposing of, or is it pretty much reached its useful life and then we're... we're no, generally we're putting it on... Uh, Public Works takes care of putting that on a um, website, and it's auction. being an auction. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. so there is some well, revenue. So there is some revenue. And we, so in. it's fair to say we'd probably see a decreased revenue the longer we use this, the more mileage, more usage we get out of this equipment. Yes. That that. Yeah, and there is a trade value that is yeah. programmed in to go against this. You can also expect higher maintenance expense. I mean, right. that's part of uh, staying true to the equipment replacement schedule is to sell it while it's still worth something and before it starts to cost you yeah. mm -hmm. significantly. So are these, so when, so I know we had this question last year. I can't remember how we answered. So when, where does the trading value go? Is this the net figure that we're seeing that's bonded, or is that the gross figure that's bonded? Right. That's the gross. So where do the proceeds from the sale oh, go? It's in a revenue, revenue. line. Yeah, it's it's in a revenue line. In a, yeah. So you, there's a corresponding revenue line. Okay. For that trade value, yes. yes. Okay. And then do you have anything on the, so that would be a capital equipment, capital improvements? And I have nothing in projects this year. Nothing in projects. Okay. Nothing. Just yeah, the building. Yeah, just the yeah, building. Building. Yeah, building. Yeah, just 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 building. Did we tell him to bring friends? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> friends and family? Yeah. <laughs> friends and family? Yeah, exactly. So I think uh, Todd came up and, and met all of you, but for those here watching and here in the audience, uh, Todd Susan, our brand new community services director, started last Monday. Last Monday. So, Day uh, seven. We thought we'd. Get him right in the in the fray here with us. Um, Bill Reichel, of course, uh, has been interim director and, and has been uh, involved with the administration of the department, uh, and is certainly here as a resource that we need to draw upon it as well. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Absolutely. So you're looking to us, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I just have a quick question. It's kind of, again, a reoccurring theme for me. I know last year we had lots of conversations around organics and are they effective and where are we and where do we plan to go and some type of cost-benefit analysis. But it struck me this year, at least in the write-up, on page 41 and on page 42, organics are mentioned specifically as being, you know, part of the budget driver. So in more labor in particular for the organics, is that is that... How big of a number is that driving this year's increase versus, I mean, each year we talk, it seems like that's a reason why we're asking for more, is that the organics are costing us a lot more than we anticipated. And I'm just, just curious, that's all. Um, again, having four or five days to go over stuff and, and talking <laughs> to Bill. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Having four or five days, of, I'm going to defer a lot to Bill and feel free to chime in any time. Um, but sometimes there's more applications that need to take place, which creates more manpower, which more services, weather dependent, where more traditional um, applications sometimes can be, um, I don't want to use the word more effective, but sometimes more timely in the sense of how it's used, less manpower, re less resources. Um, from my understanding, the organic program is a choice that the council has made. Um, we're in the process right now, Bill um, can chime in, but we're looking at how to reduce that footprint, looking at services we may be able to do in-house versus contracted services. Can we do that with our qualified staff, whether it's training or pieces of equipment to increase efficiency um, as we increase our own education on the organics? I mean, I guess, you know, the frustration is just a little bit is last year we kind of had this conversation saying, geez, we'd really like to see some type of meaningful comparisons between cost of organics all in both labor and materials and outcomes versus more conventional means. Last year there was more labor put in, and it sounded like we felt like we were, that was going to sustain us and we're going to get ahead of it or even with it. And I, I just don't know if it's just the way this is written up, 
or whether there's another new layer of significant labor and costs that are coming into the budget this year that we hadn't anticipated last year. That's no, that's what's driving my question here. So it's, it's written up as if it's a significant budget driver. And and for the grounds maintenance, it is. Um, we're actually looking to reduce um, the line we pay for organics by trying to do some of those services in-house this year. Uh, we're reducing it by 5,600. It's not a ton, but we're looking to do some of that on our own and to see what that uh, will save us in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, we did run some numbers, and the m more services we do offer, um, it will reduce that than having an independent contractor come in and do it. Um, depends on how far into that you want to get, because if you get too far into it, you're going to have to hire another person. So we're looking at doing some of the bare essentials that we feel we can do in-house with just our staff and renting some equipment. And we did reduce that number this year um, by $5,000 roughly um, because of that. Yeah, there are no additional labor costs. I think that that uh, right. statement is in the drivers is a bit of a holdover. I think staff oh, okay. still sees it as a, as a cost. There's a cheaper way of doing it, um, but we're doing it to meet the council's directives and policy. It, 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 I, my understanding also is that we're about to be scrutinized a little bit stronger through the state for wastewater runoff and things like that. Is that factored into the cost? Because uh, if we're going to have, uh, you know, have to now deal runoff, treat runoff differently because we're not using organics or we're using some harsher pesticides or whatever it is we're using, I'd like to see that bigger picture approach taken as well. So I'd like to, before we shift back over again, I'd love to be able to consult with with Mike or planning to to see what that's going to do to our our, our uh, EPA or main EPA requirements for for monitoring runoff and that kind of stuff. Because yeah, I'm not aware if there's any direct costs related to the two, but clearly they they are related. Yeah, and, and it may going forward our MS4 permit, which is a federal permit for stormwater runoff, uh, may well speak to those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think next year it'd be just good to sometime during the year really get firmly grounded on it if we're in the right place for the program yep. that we need to do. Second question I had on page 44, you, you talk about, and I think this is the recreational programs, you talk about, you know, it's not a huge increase, but 42,000 increase. And you talk because it, it sounds like the budget drivers are number of programs offered, supplies. Are we adding programs or is this level services? But if we're doing the same programs, mm -hmm. Why is it a $42,000 increase in cost? A lot of it's payroll, so I don't know if there's... there's. That's, yeah, that's all staffing, man. Um, part of that is coming up. We're slowly increasing our staff costs to apply, uh, comply with the regulations for minimum wage, so that goes up every year. We were at the very bottom of that, but we've slowly started to increase that um, to try and, and become legal. No. What, do you, what do you mean become legal? I mean, it, it, it's a 12% increase in payroll. And so was that, is that's, that, is it's that all, more hours? It's or? not more hours. It's, it's higher kind of hourly rates. Right. It's hourly rate. higher hourly rates. So we weren't paying minimum wage before? We were, we're at $9 now. January 1st is yeah. 10 So that continues to go up every year until it'll be $12 an hour. Yeah, so we're slowly increasing that every year as, it, as we have to. But uh, let me... But maybe. Are you saying we have to match Portland, or we choose to match Portland? It's two pieces. We do compete with Portland, Maryland, and way that went up to 1010. So as part of phasing our case plan, and we're also trying to compete with some of our season. But we don't have to, by regulation or by law, right? The Portland piece, no. So we're making a choose to, to bump pay. So is that, is, that the, is that the majority of the cost driver in here, is we're hey, bumping yeah. the pay to match Portland? Mm -hmm. In or the Portland and state regulations, because we were paying we were paying the bare minimum to most of our, like our grounds maintenance staff was making 750, and we did increase them. I believe the minimum now is nine dollars. So we were we went up to that last year, and as it's slowly progressing, we're trying to instead of doing it all at once, do it slowly over the time frame. I guess it would be helpful of this number to know how much of it is being driven by meeting state law. Okay. Versus us uh, yep. choosing a market that we want to mirror, right. because that's that's a pretty big bump. And is there a way that we could get there slower? Right. This may not be the year to make that big jump. Right. 
and, and we can do that fairly easily looking at our, our staff and who's coming back. Uh, the challenge is going to be for us is got to look at that over a six-month period because if it's January 1st, 2018, it goes up to 10. So sometimes wage goes up to 10. The minimum mm -hmm. wage. So the minimum wage for anybody is going up to $10 an hour in the state of Maine. Yeah, but I, but I heard two different... No, no, I understand what you're saying. Two different influences. A state, state law we have to follow. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything additional to that to match Portland is something we're choosing to do. No, I understand completely. And so I was only trying to tease out yep. of this pretty big increase. Yep. How much is choice? Absolutely. And how much is required? Yep. So we can get that for you. My point was just <coughs> knowing that part of that factor is January 1st, everybody goes to $10 at that point too, which is in this operational budget. Right. So just well, there's a six-month window we can look at and then how that affects going forward, absolutely. And will we so, get this? Uh, sorry, sorry, yep. And with this, will we get revenues that completely offset these increases? We're slowly doing that too. Like uh, we did increase, the biggest one we have is child care. Yeah. So we can care, increase those fees. Um, it's roughly $5 a week, and it, it helps to offset the majority of those. The increase was $5 yeah. a week. Right. What's the total cost for, for per child per week for, for day? For uh, it ranges depending on how many days anywhere. I think it's from 150, if they want before and after care, I think 372 is the cap end. 372? I think yeah. that's what it is. So, so I like, for this, like, what I'd love to have is if we can raise fees right. to cover this right. cost, so, so it's a break even. But I don't think taxpayers should necessarily have to subsidize these programs. So, and if you look, these these programs do <coughs> completely cover their costs. Well, so. uh, you said we're getting there slowly. So I'm just, I'm just. Yeah, and and these this programs. This is a big bump next year. Yeah. yeah right. If you look at what the programs bring in in revenue versus their expenses, um, they far, like especially childcare, they they far exceed what. Right. So so let me let me maybe I could clip maybe might help a little bit. Um, so the wages are going up across the board. Mm -hmm. So you're talking Correct. groundskeeping people, you're talking people that are taking care of the fields, not just yeah, child right. care workers. Correct. Child care workers might be at the same level, yeah. but they're generating more revenue in that program yes. mm -hmm. to cover their expenses plus what uh, maybe a little bit more or at least cover their expenses. Right. So we're not talking, I, I, and I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. It doesn't sound like we're using tax dollars to supplement daycare. It looks like that's going to maintaining recreational right. facilities in town that people are using. All, all I'm trying to do, Chris, is I, I'm trying to understand in this bucket on page 44, which yep. is recreational programs, right. mm -hmm. big bucket, yep. Yep. Right. what's in yep. there. Yep. 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 That's yep. where they're saying there's this 12%, 13% increase in payroll. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So just trying to tease out what's causing that. So yep. it sounds like it's a bunch of services. Mm -hmm. right. Some of it is because we're going up to match Portland, which is a voluntary change. Mm -hmm. Some of it is minimum wage. For those that are minimum wage changes, you learn how many. We should pass those costs on. Yeah, for correct. matching the Portland marketplace, given where we are in our financial cycle, we may want to think about the timing of that. That's right. all I'm yeah, Absolutely. Understood. Yeah. Tom, can you take us to tab 10, page 15? So I can see if I can clarify this. Yeah. If I'm looking at this correctly, this is the summary page for community services. Mm -hmm. And on the bottom it says that the community services appropriation is increasing $3,649. Correct. Yet the revenue is increasing 50295 So Correct. therefore, if I'm looking at this correctly based on Councillor Hayes' comments, this is not being supported by an increase in taxes but by an increase in revenue? No, it's actually, revenue is actually going down, Councillor Bayblon. That's a decrease? That's a decrease. Where am I looking? No, it's an no, increase. No, it's an yeah. no. Yeah, no. fifty thousand. Okay. So yes, you're going to say a positive number in revenues is always <laughs> yep. an increase. Yep. 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 A negative expenses is, right. is, a, is not positive. But and I think uh, in the big picture, we're something in the order of eighty-five or eighty-six percent yep. funded without tax dollars for the overall. And so, therefore, the total amount that's being requested to be funded by tax dollars is five sixty-nine six seventy out of that total budget which is in the green? Correct. Yes. So, so my plug, and so last year I gave Ms. Reichel a pass because uh, the previous uh, director um, had him actually come down and present. And yep. so uh, <laughs> knowing Mr. Reichel for a little bit longer yep. when he was in my neighborhood, I gave him the pass and so I'll give it a little bit. I hope that we seriously look going forward to increasing that percentage of total fees covering the total cost of these services because um, I've said this uh, for 15 years that I've been doing this, yep. that I have no problem having 
a consumer-driven enterprise account like this pay 100% of its costs and not have it come out, even though I understand there's some fixed costs that are associated with the town as a whole. Right. Community services in this town is highly valuable and the parents will pay. Absolutely. And they should pay. Yeah. And, and, and I agree 100% and things that we've been talking over this first week and, and the pass that I get is I get to ask a lot of questions because I'm new and, and uh, get to figure stuff out and we've been talking about, you know, our revenue streams and what those are and reevaluating fees, field use, turf use, what our structures are, what we charge at every program, what those cost offsets are. Uh, we're evaluating right now because we have to get our sponsorship letters out, how we do some more commercial sponsorship to offset some of our costs. So we are going to go through those process, and, and Bill's been very helpful through this conversation of our first day. So, And, and I did want to mention, because actually if no one knew that the annual report comes out, and I usually use this as kind of the measure because it's audited. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, and I didn't have a chart recent, it does appear, so in the past community services has both been, um, uh, sort of, they have generated significantly more than what has been budgeted on their revenue side, and they've also um, had expenses significantly higher because it takes those expenses to create the revenues. And that revenue has, by the way, been what has gone into surplus. Some might criticize and say it's really taxes, but it's really the, it's the consumer demand for community services mm -hmm. that's a big part of that. Right. And I noticed that in this year, it's the first year, it's what I would call flat, where there hasn't been a significant surplus as a result of those two activities. So. I am cautious and wanting to make sure that user level, you know, usership right. doesn't decrease yep. um, too significantly as a result because then we're defeating the purpose. Absolutely. One of the things that I've been looking at this first week and again through questions is what are those public goods services that we're trying to offset with revenue? It's always that fine balance of what we're willing to charge out over here. We're almost $300,000 in this building operation. Mm -hmm. um, the services we provide to the school as far as lining and field maintenance and when those adjustment costs come in. Um, found out we have 166 trash cans in town that we provide those public goods. What are those services that are public good services and how do we not outprice ourselves so people start choosing to use community services but appreciate what we offer? So we'll go through those those analytics. So, so I was going to give them a month, but since we're <laughs> here. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, uh, this is my fifth budget cycle, three for the school, second one for the town. Um, I'd love to see your analytics when okay. you're done with them because uh, I still uh, am, am trying to figure out how uh, community services and schools are entwined and entangled and who's paying what, when, where, and mm -hmm. how. So I think there's a great opportunity there for shared services. Um, I think there's a great opportunity for discussions there about where those cost centers should be and where they ought to be located. And mm -hmm. I'm not advocating for one way or another right, right. now, but I think that's a that's a real that's that's a could be a tough discussion, but I think it needs to happen mm -hmm. uh, because I think there's there's some areas whether it's you know one group ceding full responsibility to another or vice versa or how that works. But yep. um, I, I think clear, clearing that up a little bit in terms of which silos doing what sure. would be uh, very helpful. Very, very helpful. Just to add, I think it's um, not just from an understanding perspective, I think it will help in a relationship process for us with the school department, school board, as well as with the community and understanding because they are so intermingled and they have right. been for years. Right. And, and I'm, I mean, again, and the flip side of that, and we've had this discussion in the past, uh, the schools may not like what they see. Right. <laughs> I mean, it could very well be that, uh, you know, the community service has been subsidizing the the, the maintenance of the fields, and uh, if it's turned over to them, that that's an increased cost they'll have to bear on their operational budget somehow. So, but I think it's an, al an analysis right. that needs to be uh, uh, joint with the school department so that there's buy-in from the output, you know, the message that comes out of that. Yeah, keep in mind what we get in exchange right. is free use of uh, yep. a lot of fields. facilities. Right. And so right. Yep. Uh, there is some reciprocal right. yep. piece we need yep. to quantify. It. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And I will say, there's a, in my short time, there's been a great relationship as far as conversations. Oh, open and, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a good relationship right now. So that's, a, that's an unusual piece as far as a lot of towns because they're looking separate. So I, I like the one message, yeah. one budget. Take advantage of the honeymoon. Get something, you know, yeah. for six months and push, push, push. <laughs> Can you guys talk to us a little bit about your capital improvement? And yeah. so you've got 60000 for a gate system which is down at Higgins, the Higgins Beach parking lot. That was, we talked about that last year, too. Mm -hmm. so that comes from a reserve account? Yeah. Beach yeah. reserve account? Yeah. 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 Is there any... We need to do that. Can that be pushed? Uh, do we have... Last year we had an agreement dumped through the Higgins Beach personnel, kind of open the gate and close the gate in exchange for... There's new ownership, but... Uh, yeah. 
I have full expectations that they intend to step into those shoes and to do that service, but I think we've long held uh, and understood there's a better way of doing it. Yep. Uh, it's a very tight neighborhood. The, the abutters um, often have challenges with, with the gate not exactly getting closed at time on time and such, so we would rather get to an automated system. Uh, I think we'll see some decreased staff costs in the future depending on the system we put in place. We won't need the, the parking attendance. What would be the benefit of, uh, not, since it's coming out of reserves, which is not an appropriation, well, it's an appropriation, but the funding is already identified, it's in savings. Uh, what's the benefit of delaying that? I don't see any myself. Okay. All right. So, um, on the revenue side of things, Tom, can you um, remind me again, where do the parking fees go? Is that, that doesn't go into community services revenue? Right? Police. Okay. Okay. Um, or, I, I, nor does they have any expense, so it's right. No, I, yeah, no, I, I, be seen there. no I, I understand that. Um, if I could, um, just through the chair, I, I'd like to look at the fee structure uh, also. We neglected to bring that up with the police, but I think that's something that we need to look at is the, the parking. parking fee structure. We put a placeholder in last year, um, but I don't know if we want to go back. Or Higgins that. Beach in particular? Yeah. yeah. That's and on section three, by the way, very last several pages. Yeah. I'm not saying to implement, I'm just saying we need to look at it and, and review that as an opportunity to perhaps change it. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. The dump truck needs to that be pushed at all or is that a... That's okay. got almost 120,000 miles on it, if not more, and is starting to rust out. I think if we brought it to Public Works again, they would um, <laughs> have a hard time getting it back to us. Yeah. <laughs> Does it go down the beach? Oh, that's yeah, it's the one that goes down to the beach. Okay, so a new truck. Is, it, is the new truck going to go down the beach? The plan would be we have a one another dump truck that takes the landscaping equipment around, send that one down to the beach, and then use that one in place of it. So. And then the capital improvement. There's 65 for a cable room upgrade and 20 for carpet. So the cable room upgrade is this this facility. Um, and it's that's so when we started that process, that's all the bells and whistles. It doesn't mean that's what it's going to be at the end of the day. Um, it's to replace every camera, all screens, um, rewire everything in this facility, and um, kind of bring bring it together. It's been piecemeal over the last 25 years, and certain things don't talk to each other the way they should, and allow this to become a a broadcast center like um, it should be. Completely support it. Yeah, I do, I do but just, just, just <laughs> out of, yeah, out of, out of curiosity, though, Bill, is there, because I've heard in the past, and it's hearsay, rumors, and allegations, and everything else, but that there's actually also a challenge between this building and and Time Warner Cable that's receiving the signal. So, so what happened, um, we could send out an HD signal. Mm -hmm. Time Warner Cable is always going to send out a standard def signal. Mm -hmm. So when it, we can take an HD signal, dumb it down to standard def, and then broadcast it through your cable box. The problem is it's the only TV that you have your cable attached to that mm -hmm. you get channel two and three. Um, it'll be able to be streamed on the internet in HD. So, yeah, I'm just thinking more in terms of the broadcast quality because right now it's pretty it's and that's shaky. That's that quality is it's probably going to stay. It's yeah. here. Okay. It's that standard def. Gotcha. Okay. So it's nothing's high def, um, and we do have this. This um, produces all, all anything that's taped at the schools. So um, the basketball games, the mm -hmm. anything under the outside on the turf is broadcast through this the central hub. Would this also include? Uh, I know the remote cameras that we use um, would would include upgrades for those as well because I think we had some challenges in the past with remote broadcasting, right? So I believe it includes one camera that you can broadcast Wi-Fi through. Okay. So you'd be anywhere you have Wi-Fi, you'd be able to take that camera, film in that location, send it here, and then do that process, either dumb it down or leave it on the internet for HD. And do our do all of our uh, public facilities, police and fire, have Wi-Fi as well, or is it just librarians? They do, okay, okay. So have we looked at any long-term plan regarding cable television? I mean, it's cable television is a huge resource for, the, for us as a community. I, I get a lot of calls from seniors who are like, how come, you know, we don't have better programming on two and three so they can watch the council meetings because they're not gonna come to a meeting? Um, is this just phase one of maybe two or three steps, or is this just a quick fix to 
so the the upgrade will fix this room. The programming options, yeah. um, that's another. It, it will allow us to do more of those. You it could go down to potentially the park and with a, a transmitter box and send signals or anywhere um, and do programming offerings. So, but in terms of creating content, that's really staff driven. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, it, I'm talking more about quality. So as you, it's kind of weird because when you're watching at home, um, you know certain areas you can tell are uh, much higher quality. It's like mm -hmm. those two ends. Are qual high quality, and when they look at this table here, it's like the 1970s. That's intentional, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like really static, and so it's really, it's just, it's kind of weird. Um, this would fix. We've got 20 years of different cameras. Yeah. Still mm -hmm. active. But even the quality of the microphones, that I mean, they're scattered, and sometimes they're really good, and you pick up some really interesting conversations that counselors don't think that they can hear. <laughs> um, so I just kind of, it's more about that kind of part of it. And that that upgrade is supposed to do kind of all. Oh, okay. Good. So. Audio, video, wiring, yeah. uh, everything here is 20, at least behind the walls, is 20 or two years old. Just on the, on the one of the best um, council chambers that I've seen that has community television is Gorham. Um, we were there for a regional meeting and it was pretty spectacular what they had there. Um, very high end and you didn't have to, you know, speak very loudly because everything got picked up mm -hmm. and the TV itself was actually very, very good so I'd love to see us get to that level. Is, is there any equipment in the in the control room at all that needs to be replaced too or is that just cameras wiring and that would replace that yeah, stuff that's too. A full, if you full, okay. went in and saw that that looks like you're launching one of those old yeah. NASA space shuttles. Mm -hmm. yeah. North Korea looks North like Korea they had a they had a more yeah. advanced yeah. launch center I think, I think North Korea has better check <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then and then there's twenty thousand for carpet replacement, which is an appropriation which was down in the planning department. But it, it's everything. Mm -hmm. The, uh, yeah, Ken Kennedy is. Uh, we're, we're trying to systematically work our way through yeah, the building, the building. and uh, the, the bottom floor is this is their year. But but I thought weren't didn't we talk about weren't you thinking about remodeling the planning department to we, some degree too? Didn't that yeah, wasn't that was part of we nixed it? Well, well, I know. So I'm just wondering yeah. if that's if that's still in place some year. Whether that's the place to do carpeting or wait till we don't know. Because I, I know you were trying to change the entranceway and other stuff down there. Anyway, just thought. Mm -hmm. it, are we talking like 20-year-old ratty, moldy, nasty stuff that's a potential health issue, or are we just in, no, in our... No, it's starting to show wear and fray. Okay. Uh, yeah. it, it really is time to, it's time to be replaced. And we've systematically worked our way through the, yeah. the town hall. The school department, I think, was the most recent recipient. And incidentally, we're going with floor ti carpet tiles rather than roller carpet, so as you have a fill or a wear spot, you can actually just pull up the square and yep. replace that. So Final planking? Unless you don't have a s square to spare. <laughs> I guess I remember that. Buy extra when you put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things that come out of here. <laughs> come on, I'm right. Seinfeld. Thank, Seinfeld. thank God we like each other. <laughs> Else, guys? Guys I'm good. good. Well, welcome. I hope that wasn't too too okay. brutal. We actually, we went we went kind of easy on you. But appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now here comes the grilling. Did you join me? Come on up. You've trained them well. <laughs> the event questions come up. So we move on to executive. The executive uh, kind of takes in a, a bit of a strange kettle of fish, if you will. Um, we've done some reorganization with two new staff positions coming on kind of two-thirds of the year last year. Uh, but we took the opportunity to really kind of uh, reorganize it, so at least it made logical sense to us. So the executive uh, division, if you will, covers myself and, and my operations. What we're calling administration is really the assistant town manager who's also a uh, purchasing director. So there's a purchasing specialist that was moved over from finance and is realigned in that department. And also the sustainability coordinator appears there. So you can see some big changes there. It really has to do with full annualized uh, cost of the positions and then a realignment of that other position. Uh, we have legislative, legal, and insurance that all falls under this. Um, and we also have HR which would include general assistance. So my department catches some of the larger accounts that are kind of um, 
hold money uh, for contract uh, contract settlements with our labor unions. We have one contract that we're currently in negotiation on. Uh, there's money uh, in this budget for that. It also includes uh, monies for merit, uh, I think for 21 non-union staff members that have received uh, worthy of merit through the for annual performance evaluation system. And then we're also trying to uh, do better budgeting in terms of second vacation adjustments and payouts, uh, particularly with the retirement of long-term employees um, who often carry a significant time in the books and at the time of separation we, we have to pay that out obviously. They, um, so we're trying to get smarter and more realistic about budgeting those amounts. And finally, we've seen some increases in, in insurance expense, particularly on the workers' comp side. Certainly pleased to answer any questions specifically. Uh, at this point, if, and might be a good opportunity to get into the uh, the two new hirees from last year and just give us kind of the 50,000 foot view of how that's uh, working out, not necessarily you know, down to the penny. I know um, certainly been very uh, in, in pleased with the work that uh, uh, Larissa's done in finance and mm -hmm. with um, the sustainability coordinator and energy and stuff like that. But maybe just give us a kind of a brief overview of where they're at, where they're where when where they're going, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, I think uh, there's really tremendous value added. Uh, we're able to do things that have been talked about, and we're really starting to make some advances. I think your committee is one of the recipients of that. This has done some great work um, that we've been talking about for years, frankly, in terms of uh, metrics and financial condition analysis. And I, I think that's going to serve us well going forward. I think this is just the start, frankly. Uh, a companion piece to that is the benchmarking piece that's a bit out of our control. There's others that we're waiting on, but that's a piece that's equally important that we'd like to bring to you when that's when it's ready. Mm -hmm. uh, from the sustainability quarter position, you've had the occasion to work with Carrie on occasion through committee work. That's really where she's doing the bulk of her time and spending uh, her attention with committees and supporting staff. Remember that position supports essentially four functional areas. And so she's being pushed and pulled. I'm, I'm quite pleased, actually, how everyone's kind of cooperating and not being too demanding on her time. Uh, but right now she's uh, shifting once again and focusing more on the beach monitoring piece, getting mm -hmm. that up and running, the volunteers in place. Uh, and there's some really exciting energy initiatives and stormwater work that she's working on. And I think just today she's returning from our honeymoon. So <laughs> oh, oh wow. Wow. Uh, nice. Nice. Wow. Yes, and my apologies. So, from my perspective, it's been tremendous, and um, my workload doesn't seem to have slacked off. In fact, I, I feel busier than ever. Uh, for those that thought that I would just be putting my feet up with an assistant, that's certainly not the case. But I, I think the sort of quantity and quality of work produced uh, has really um, risen quite significantly. H have you given any thought to how, if, if you wanted to put a dollar value quantifying that? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you do that because I, I mean, I can feel the, there are some um, um, intangible benefits for sure that we can see. But I know one of the things that we talked about last year in justifying that position was showing a, a, a hard ROI type of thing. Um, I'm open to however you'd like to, to, to do that, to get that out there. Um, I, and I, I certainly don't, I'm not looking for a dollar to dollar comparison, but, you know, things like the, the composting program, um, you know, there's, there is certainly a, a, a benefit to that. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, the, the staff assistance and things like that. So I, I, I'm not necessarily looking for that right now, um, but just, sure. you know. No, it, uh, we're very mindful of that. Remember these positions started just in yep. October, so we yep. have six months, just to, in our seventh month, so uh, really starting to gain some traction, but uh, I'm very acutely aware that we need to really justify and focus on the bottom line. What sort of savings are we getting from the, you know, on the purchasing side? And then I think I think you're really going to be impressed on the sustainability for the other side. Uh, there's a project that you talked about, the, the uh, LED streetlights, yeah. which has a <laughs> tremendous uh, ROI. There's some upfront capital costs, but are they going to share that, by the way? <laughs> I'm, I'm certain that we would. That project wouldn't be as far along as it is without her attention to it. We certainly started talking about it, but she's taking the ball and run with it. So, as part of, um, I'm sorry. Did you I was going to say, Tom, may I? You may. Okay. Also, um, through the Trigen, 
that is going to be one of the places that you're going to see quite a bit of savings. We've already realized um, n almost $9,000 in savings just from having a couple of pairs of eyes that are able to track that and notice a rate change that we were able to implement. Um, so I think you're going to see some some satisfaction for your ROI figures, not only from having a purchasing agent that's able to better focus on how what sort of relationships we can form with our energy suppliers, but also having a very um, highly skilled and, and experienced energy consultant in our sustainability coordinator. So um, I feel confident that at the end of the year we actually could show you dollars and cents that would pay for Carrie um, not just salary, but her whole package. Right. I'm probably not as worthwhile. Um, <laughs> but I will have to just kind of rest on the intangibles for my position right. and let Carrie do the heavy lifting as far as bringing the dollars in. Sure. Tom, I know as part of our uh, town council goals, we have a measure that we will measure against at the end of the year that maybe some t this memo kind of format that provides a cost table fully loaded, we'll have a full year, um, can be part of that. Uh, Evaluation process for our goals that you could you know provide us with that kind of summary. I think we can. That, that would that timing I think that would work out fairly. Yeah. I think perfectly well. Yeah, and I wouldn't forget the uh, the opportunity for shared services either. I mean, if we can, if the if the energy package works out and the it's a it's a contracting service that that the department school department and the town can benefit from, uh, you know certainly that's you know I, I would I would include that as well because it is, uh, you know it, it is supposed to be the one town one budget so. You know, no, we, we have rekindled the uh, conversations around cooperative purchasing, and I, there's certainly some room to go there. Yep. Yep. Uh, they've been very receptive to the conversation, so we need to see that through. Yep. I did have one, actually, one question in the budget, sure. um, only because um, this is a fairly, this is a very lean budget, uh, with its uh, cost drivers really being within the healthcare. Mm -hmm. I actually prim primarily workers' compensation. Um, the one area that I saw was actually the general assistance housing. Um, went up uh, right. significantly um, in comparison. I mean, it's only it's an increase of only three thousand. But it, has there been a change in policy? Because it looks like it's been level funded at about seven. Uh, we've never gone over budget. Um, I was just wondering what the driver was. That's a great question. We have, as you know, we have an on-call GA coordinator who works in the building on Wednesdays, but is on call 24/7. And he and I got together to look at this budget to anticipate where some of our needs may be. And he has seen an increase in short-term housing, really? um, and has tried to reallocate appropriately some of the resources for that. And um, we've had some some changes and. He's predicting that would continue forward with um, um, some predictability that we're seeing. So you're seeing that 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 trend kind of going to be consistent based on just y are you doing a, an average or is it just best based on last year's? Based on last year um, okay. and some of the need that we've seen continuing forward and mm -hmm. an increase in. Um, some of the inquiries in, in short-term housing specifically. We don't fund hotels. There's been a lot of requests to do that, um, and he's been able to move some of those individuals from shelters into local homes um, in Scarborough. So, so can you so how does that, how does that work? This is a kind of a unique community where we don't have um, a lot of apartments today. Um, that where I would see the short-term housing issue, because I would imagine that it wouldn't. It, I suppose there could be some in a single-family home situation given certain circumstances. I mean, um, so how does the request come in and what does it pay for, you know? So it's, it's driven by the, the ordinance and the statute. Um, there's a very thorough questionnaire. Um, when someone comes in needing assistance, sometimes they don't specifically ask for, for anything. Yeah. They just say, I, I need help. And so he goes through a questionnaire and really sees what they qualify for under the ordinance. Um, emergency housing is, is Portland generally, um, but he, we also have partnerships with a few landlords in town who do work with us to meet some of those thresholds as far as what we can reimburse um, for housing, and we would cut a check directly to the landlord in that case. Um, so depending on the availability of those units and um, what the individuals may need, if there are seniors involved or situations with health issues or young children, that all factors okay. into it. Keep in mind, this may not be a homeless situation. It's maybe someone in a rental unit that is find themselves in need. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a. Um, so when you said that the uh, hotels aren't included, what, do you, what did you mean by that? Hotels aren't. So sometimes um, someone will come in and say, "I need a place to stay tonight," 
I'm at, I'm at a hotel in the area. Um, it's in our policy and in uh, yep. ordinance that we won't pay for hotel stays. So in that case, someone would have to go to a shelter or we work with them to find a lease and get them into a, a regular housing situation. And, um, so is the qualification, this is like one time a year, so I, sorry for all the questions. Uh, no, I always forget from they're me. good questions. Yeah, um, so, but they have to be a Scarborough resident to qualify? They do. Okay, all right. Thank you. Is the general assistance heating, is that LIHEAT or is that a separate program that we do in town? That's a separate program. This would be direct assistance for the someone's heating costs. Yeah. Again, yeah. depending on eligibility. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't know if that was if that was the, the, like a state bond that came in through Hawaii Heat, or if that's you know. And I know Project Grace does something as well in addition. So it's okay. Yeah. And I don't, I don't believe there's any capital items uh, or yeah. projects yeah. or yeah. equipment. No. You good, Chris? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Um, okay. Guess we're good. Um, maybe a suggestion to name. Maybe take just a, like a five-minute break between segments here and a bio break, and we'll reconvene in about five minutes.
Mexico. That's all. That, 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 that's, a, that's a fake story. No, I am not. It's real. That's fake news. I know. He knows he didn't write it. Either one, I'm ready to talk about the bond. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're both part of the budget. Um, I don't know if I made enough copies for everyone, but I'll start from the front. What I'm distributing here, uh, this is really a, a product that the superintendent and I worked on, um, I guess, through the Joint Finance Committee process. Uh, there was a meeting where we offered to put our heads together and come back to you with a proposal. The upshot of that proposal uh, makes a significant adjustment to the to the budget uh, to the tune of 1.55 <clears throat> million. And that's made up through a combination of revenue enhancements or better adjustments and expenditure decreases. So what I want to do tonight is update you on certainly the municipal side. So the first sheet is uh, a fairly detailed overview of where those expenditure reductions would come from. And though uh, I really wanted to avoid uh, any decrease in service, and I, I don't really expect uh, the residents will see any decrease, because much of what we took out are a couple of very small enhancements that we had programmed, such as the part-time position in code to handle the additional workload. Um, uh, Nancy's here from the library. She might disagree with me, but we <laughs> modified that position and kept it at the full-time, uh, part-time status. Chief Thurlow mentioned his part-time billing clerk uh, has been removed. And paving is another one that we looked at. I really wanted to try to preserve all of these pieces. Um, so long story short, my goal was 225000 and we slightly exceeded that. And that was part of a compromise approach, if you will, between the town and the school. We've shared proportionally kind of all the way along. Um, there's a there's a other component to this which involves uh, three different revenues that we've taken another look at. We're proposing an extra $200,000 in exercise tax. Uh, there's a number of switches in the capital budget from uh, appropriations to bonding or some other method of finance and then the homestead um, exemption adjustment as well. So all together between that $459,640 in revenue enhancements uh, and this 227,369 decrease in expenditures, our, the town's contribution to this effort is $687 and $9. And you can see the corresponding adjustment on the school side. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, the Board of Ed uh, adopted all these proposed adjust, uh, adjustments at their last meeting and second reading, so those are kind of booked. And um, I'd like to suggest that this is something we could put in a form of a formal motion, be part of your formal recommendations when that time comes. Uh, beyond that, uh, to remind you and those present and listening, uh, there's been a further charge to see if we can take another 250 out of the budget, and we're currently working on that. I'm not prepared to speak to that this evening but we'll be prepared to do that at the joint meeting Thursday night. Okay. Um, I think we're going to grab the first hour, 6 to 7, will be a joint meeting. Uh, and then the Board of Ed, I believe that they have their own meeting. Mm -hmm. And then we can continue on if you like. So the effect of this, and I, I have uh, also attached a revised 
tax rate computation page in the, the, the green shaded section um, shows the effect of this reduction and it uh, effectively produces the expected tax rate increase in the range of 3.23% to a high of 4.56%. And the last uh, directive, if you will, or challenge from the joint finance, uh, that extra 250 will get us uh, looking at the mid-range, if you will, below 3.5%. I believe that's how that number was derived. Yep. At, at or below. <laughs> so can so I, I just wanted to yep. bring up to, up to speed as to where I propose making these adjustments. So Tom, can I ask a question? Please. So um, thank you very much for the detail. Um, I believe that we were actually provided this um, at the, um, at least, I think we were, um, at the uh, workshop, uh, at the public forum um, as individuals. I think we, I've seen this before. I can't remember where now I've seen this. Yes, I have not, I, I did not provide the details. Right, not that's okay. what I'm doing. This not, I don't know why, but uh, maybe I just let start talking to you as being chair. The question I have is, uh, one is, with the additional directive to reduce the total budget by 250, where would that take our tax range? Well, um, it will be shared proportionally, so yeah. it's 165 school, 85 per town. Yeah. And um, right now, um, Ruth's actually scouring back through the, the revenue lines. I think it's going to be nickels and dimes at this point. Uh, but yeah, that's I'm, first I'm looking word. just for the tax rate. What, do you know what the net impact Because I don't have that sheet that had the... Well, our, our directive was to hit three and a half at that midpoint. Mid that was our directive. Or I'm request. sorry, I thought you said that with the change already that we're at 3.5%, wouldn't that 250 take us below No, that? 250 will get oh, us okay. below 3.5%. Yeah, right. we're at 3.89. I can't see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we're at, we're at 3.89 okay. with what he just described. So, yeah. so the additional 250 would have get us to the 3.23 to 4.56? No, we're at 3.23 to 4.56. I'm not, yeah. I didn't, for this purposes, report okay. the midpoint. Oh, that's fine. I got it now. 3.89 is, is the midpoint on that range. Correct. Yeah. With the additional 250, the midpoint is 3.5. Okay. The second question I have is that um, given the timeline, um, it would seem to me, and this is for the chair, I guess, it would seem to me that it would be prudent for us to actually have a motion this evening to approve the budget or approve a recommended budget with these changes and then allow it to go to the council as a whole and then accept those additional changes that are coming forward at that council letter, um, at the council meeting on the, because um, I believe that's what we did last two years. Well, you have another meeting on yeah, Thursday night. We have one so more meeting. I, I might suggest that's joint, correct? Mm -hmm. Only for an hour, mm -hmm. and then you'll carry on. That's about the school board. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're meeting, it's a joint finance community meeting. Six. At six, six to seven, yeah. Right. And then you can. And, and then we're having, I thought we were having ours. Okay. Yeah, ours, after, just after the town one. council okay. where right. we will prepare our recommendations. Right. Okay, correct. And then our recommendations will go to the, to the town council for sure. the seven so you, you, I, I, I'm you rushing it, I guess. Grab these tonight, or you could so save and I, do them whatever uh, on Friday the or Thursday. Else, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy waiting, I mean, because I mean, we know, that I'm, I'm assuming there are going to be some adjustments um, coming as well, and, um, you know, I, no. I, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable I'm comfortable I, I agree. I mean, I think it's cleaner if we have all of the adjustments yeah. from yeah. staff, yeah. that way we're presenting yeah. what the staff's yeah. position is. Yeah. Um, and then um, the council can then deliberate as a whole right. on the 17th. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I shouldn't say the council as a whole, but the, oh, I'm sorry, on the 17th, yes. Yeah. And then we as a, this next, Thursday, next, this Thursday we yeah. as, as a yep. finance committee will. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our recommendation our, our comes, recommendations. comes yeah. Thursday, yeah. And typically, though it doesn't happen to ha have to happen this way, uh, the finance committee's recommendation is typically accepted as the initial amendment at second reading. Uh, so it at least gets in front of the council, and it will do as a body what you'll do with it. Um. So I you guys, you guys good? Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I did want to just say um, I do I do appreciate the effort. I know it's uh, um, it's a it's it is. Uh, I've been very impressed with the professionalism of of uh, the way the superintendent and the town manager are working together to to shoulder that responsibility. And we are we are really taxing them. No pun intended. We're challenging them this year. Um, so I, I know it's a, uh, it's a little bit of a different approach than we did last year, um, but, I, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a budget that nobody likes, but hopefully everybody can support. So. And the only thing I think I maybe ask, you know, both of you is Thursday night, if there's any other suggestions or yeah. things you want to talk about that we can add to our recommendations, put them on the table and we'll 
have that conversation. Yep. Yeah, I'm likely to give you a menu of options, uh, where to cut, that final cut. Uh, at this point, uh, there's going to be some noticeable effect mm -hmm. of those cuts. And so I, I'm just as comfortable putting up the number of options for you and help, helping you talk through those and decide which ones you'd like to advance. Um, if hearing no objection, that's what I'll I'll do. If, yeah. if you'd I, like, I could make a specific recommendation to get us to the target as well. I would pref I would prefer the recommendation and then the options as well. If I mean, if you can do both, just to kind of uh, you know your I, recommendations, but what what the menu items might right, be. Right, right, right. I mean, I'm I'm you know again I I'm perfectly confident that you're going to come up with the right approach, um, but I'd just like to see that back up too, just to, just in case there's sure. other other thoughts. Other thoughts, yeah. yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand. So. With these, with these changes, on Thursday night, our regular finance meeting, you, you're coming forward with any ad, the additional adjustments for the 250 and your recommendations. Essentially 85 is what my charge is. Yeah. Yep. Um, but then we will also receive the school department, so we know, well, actually, we'll just know, we just know that they've accepted that they will give us their portion of that. It's my understanding that... Uh, so we don't really talk about fine items with well, theirs, but... No, but I guess from 6 to 7 will be the joint. No, I said, yep, yep. yep. And then in that, I think both Julie and Tom will present yep. what they're recommending, right. and we'll have a conversation, and then we'll break for right. our, our conversation. Correct. I think what we will have to do, though, to your point, Sean, is that whatever it, because the school board's adopted their second reading already, Correct. we'll have to make our, we'll have to make those adjustments as council, so we will have to reduce the school budget request by the 165. Correct. Right, to I, the I, bottom I, line. Right, right. 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 And so that's where I was, and I want to make sure that there's buy-in from our peers on the school board before that happens so it does not yep. create a relationship yep. uh, challenge. Yep. Yep. The second piece of that is that um, when you said that you're going to provide us with a menu of options, personally, I don't see a need for those options because as our chief executive, um, per the charter, you have complete discretion, executive discretion, on where those should come from, and I would hope that we rely on that and not try to micromanage the individual line items um, unless they are significant um, in opposing some type of goal that we might have, because right. that's what, you know, or, or the budget should achieve our goals at the and same time. And potentially so. politically unpopular. Right. I mean, I'll, right. Like and I, I, I just want to make sure that we're not uh, going rogue, I guess, and saying, uh, well, yeah, you're going to give us 200 Fifty thousand, and then you know what? We're gonna sit there and look at another two fifty and another two fifty, and yeah, uh, I understand. really go off on a tangent. That's, I just want to make sure it was kind of lined up. My 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 uh, uh, approach would be obviously to hear recommendations from staff, and, and I mean, if you know, if he's got a priority or a preference to do it. But to Tom's point, I, I'd like to ha understand what yeah. that impacts oh, mean yeah, and what it's going to do before we make. Before no, 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 I absolutely you know, I understand. Right. So. So just out of curiosity, Tom, where, with that adjustment, your additional adjustment you're talking about, that must get the, the municipal budget down. 2.23. It, it will be 2.2? 2. 2. I believe that's the... Oh. That's just a good frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, and we'll be prepared to speak on the school side. I, I don't even want to speculate where that is, but uh, right. coming down commensurately, obviously. Okay. The uh, other item, if I could just uh, get your attention and really to prepare yourself for a recommendation perhaps to the full council on Wednesday night. Um, when the council met two weeks ago, or nearly two weeks ago, there was a bond order in front of the council. They passed it in first reading. There was conversation around one of the items that was proposed for bonding, and that is the uh, Public Works fuel station replacement project. Um, this issue came to light, frankly, um, due to the keen eye of a, of a town resident. and. I'm embarrassed to say that uh, none of us caught it, and it, uh, it really failed at multiple levels um, between consultants and advisors and staff and went through this body and the full council. So, uh, but luckily we caught it, or they caught it. Um, and so the conversation has been whether that, this is appropriate to go to bond or does it in fact require voter approval um, through a different method. <coughs> um, I did consult with the town attorney, and uh, as was I think discussed at some, to some extent at the last meeting, uh, the town charter does have a number of uh, exclusions, if you will, in that uh, section 907, which pertains to um, certain items requiring voter approval. Um, there are a number of public works categories that are outright exclusions. And then there's this bit of a curious uh, piece at the end of it that has to do with declaring emergencies. And it's been some time to talk about kind of the uh, expected emergencies, fire, flood, uh, those sorts of things. 
But it goes on to say, uh, and clearly provides for a local process for the council to declare such an emergency. And um, uh, after a number of conversations with the town attorney, they were quite confident the council could choose that route if it wished, that they were going to be recommending very clear and concise rationale to support your findings, but uh, the charter appears to have been set up in such a way that it gave the council that option. So that was kind of the first legal analysis. The second one involved uh, bond council. Um, any bond issue we have, there needs to be a legal opinion really to protect the interest of prospective buyers uh, and it's incorporated as part of the official statement. And our bond council, um, hearing all of these sorts of things uh, through that legal lens, if you will, believes that there could be some chilling effect on the bond issue, um, either in scaring away potential buyers, just because of some question whether the process was followed right, uh, it could materialize in higher rates to guard against any risk. Uh, and worst case, it could potentially affect our bond rating. And just in uh, any of those scenarios, it's certainly not something I would ever recommend we, we consider doing. So having said that, I would I recommend to the full council that we remove this item from the bond order, and that can be done by simple amendment. Uh, and then in turn, add this as a referendum question on the June 13 ballot. Uh, which is already a, a sk established uh, date and election already being held. So I apologize that we find ourselves in this predicament. Uh, I've got some extra work to do since this project is moving along. We have actually a contract in place and we've got to do some unwinding, frankly, until we know what the outcome is. Uh, the reality of the situation is we have no alternative. This isn't one we can push indefinitely or not do. We're under a DP mandate and threats of fines and penalties. I suspect we can work with the DEP regarding those, but ultimately we must comply. Uh, these tanks are 30 years old and they've serviced us well and um, we have all sorts of monitoring systems so there's no problem with them per se, but they've, they've outlasted their useful life, their warranty, and that's the requirement. Uh, so the reality is that uh, should we fail at the polls, uh, we need to find a way to fund this and the charter requirements do not kick in um, unless you're borrowing money. And the prospect of uh, looking to our reserves to fund this project is, is not attractive, but I don't see another alternative. And I think part of the messaging and education to the public is that reality that this project must be done. We're gonna go to you first and get your blessing. Uh, if that fails, uh, I think we're gonna have to look at other options. But let's go to the voters first. I think because all of that's laid out in front of us in a fairly short timeline, it makes perfect sense to follow the letter and the spirit of the charter. Uh, and if that fails, I think you have other options we should talk about. I'll, I'll go first. Um, so um, I, I appreciate that explanation. I think the town manager is much too harsh on himself. Uh, my interpretation when this came in front of us was that uh, it didn't fall under the purview of the charter because it was a mandated thing that we had to comply with. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that, that rises to the level of an emergency thing, but it's not a discretionary purchase. It's not a fire truck. It's not a building. It's something that we are required to do. Um, so I, I don't. I, I certainly don't think um, there's there's definitely no conspiracy of why we're trying to hide something or anything like that. Uh, I think it's totally within the purview of the council to be able to prove something like this. Uh, I think that's our job. Uh, and um, um, I, I will ask the probably potentially unpopular question of um, is there a way that we can phase this and begin the process now uh, or at least complete partial uh, part of the contract now and part in subsequent budget cycles? Uh, to reduce that number so that the work gets done in compliance with DEP mandates and it doesn't need to be bonded. Or it doesn't need to be bonded all at once. It could be bonded in, in cycles. I don't have a complete answer to that. I can okay. tell you that uh, at the time we bid the project, it came in significantly higher than budget and so we really worked the project scope very hard to get it in budget. Uh, whether it can be broken up into multiple pieces uh, and thereby not require voter approval, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to talk to the consulting engineers to see if that's viable. Uh, mm -hmm. We need an operational fuels um, mm -hmm. island, so it's not as if we can live for much time in between. It's got to be simultaneously one's decommissioned and the other one is operational, uh, or actually the both operational for some period. Yeah. 
So uh, that's a point worth looking at. Uh, Mike Shaw, who's the project manager on this, uh, hasn't been available for the last few days, so um, I do intend to spend some time with him tomorrow and Wednesday to learn more about that, those options. Um, <clears throat> procedurally, uh, personally, I'd like to see the Finance Committee um, make a recommendation to the Council. That way that um, there's a clear message that we yep. did uh, discuss this and uh, took the manager's advice. So I would hope that maybe if we had a motion to support the recommendation, that way then you could then comment yep. about our conversation at the full Council meeting. I think that would actually support the manager's research as well as our position. Um, I agree with Chris. I think uh, the manager is being extremely too harsh on his evaluation of himself in this process. I think that uh, uh, it has been a meaningful conversation um, all the way through, uh, regardless of others. Um, I do believe that we are elected to make these type of critical decisions, and I do believe that the Charter actually contemplated this type of decision. Otherwise, it would have been more definitive in saying that we could not declare the emergency. And the fact that legal counsel tells us that we could do that um, is comforting, um, and I kind of suspected that we would get that opinion. However, I do agree with sending it to the referendum, and it purely has to do with bond counsel's uh, comments regarding the negative impact regarding uh, potential bond rating, the issuance, and the fact that she would actually have to provide a qualified opinion uh, to any bond issuance that would be right there up front mm -hmm. um, and could impact the rate, it could impact fees, it could impact a whole bunch of things. So um, while we might be um, wise in taking the initial approach, I think in the long term that uh, we would you know, be better served to let the citizens do this so that we can avoid that general bond council's comment and for qualified opinion. Yeah, and I guess I concur that, you know, we should follow the, the manager's recommendation. I, I, too, am concerned about the bond rating only because as we look ahead down the road, the projects we have coming online. Exactly. Um, it's, it's really probably nothing. We want any type of, of black mark. I mean, yeah. it's public safety building and other things we've got lined up. Um, so I guess, Sean, you're, you suggested a motion, and I guess. I, I would like to make, um, without having to go through the entire verbiage, but make a motion to accept the manager's recommendation uh, to um, approve the um, uh, division of the bond question and exclude um, the fuel station replacement of 687482 as a separate question and to send that to a referendum question. I'll second it. All those in favor? Thank you. I'll, um, I'll introduce the matter and perhaps uh, Chairman Hayes can, can report on behalf of the committee as well. Um, I, I believe we still have a couple members of council here tonight, so that's helpful just to yep. heard your conversation. <laughs> a little shaking his head no. So I think as we wind down here this evening, just a couple, we, we have mentioned these notes, uh, these dates before, but just, just for those that are at home listening, we will have a joint finance and board of education finance committee meeting at 6 o'clock on Thursday. Immediately following that, the Town Council Finance Committee will have its meeting um, where we will prepare our final budget recommendation that I, we actually will have on May 17th. Um, and then I guess this week on what, the Wednesday night we have the public comment on the budget and then on May 17th is when the Town Council will, will take up the matter of the budget and, and vote on it. And I guess with that, before we close out, is there anybody interested in public comments this evening? Good evening. There's no microphone over here tonight. Oh, believe me, we can hear you. No, no, <laughs> no time for either. Oh, no, it's on this. <laughs> Go. You get free reign. Yeah. I did when you got up. Our own design here is I came in here to talk about a, a particular issue, but uh, Tom has raised some things tonight. I'd like to say that um, the re recommendation to taking the uh, fueling station out of the box, out of the uh, the uh, the IP and putting it out as a bond, as I believe it should be, is a prudent thing to do. Uh, it will no, no doubt will pass, hopefully, and if it doesn't, we take it out of reserve. We need to get it done. My understanding is that um, I was watching on the on TV as opposed to being here. <laughs> and like this, was that the work on this is going to start in May, so we need to get this thing done. There's no way. I mean, usually no advantage to delaying something like this. So I certainly support it 100%. Uh, it goes out to referendum. Uh, hopefully it will just be, be passed. 
I don't, you know, it's just a simple error. Lots of things go on. Everyone has a thousand things to do. Our town manager certainly does. Uh, it was just an oversight. We do the right thing and move on. So that's what I have to say about that. When I came here to talk about adding money to the budget. Yes, my name is mm -hmm. Rick Harwell. <laughs> 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 Larry, the building's starting to shake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of us received one of these recently in the mail. It shows all of the different programs that the uh, library has. We talked about one, one town, one budget. I think the library encapsulates that. We've got all these programs. They've shown what kind of participation we have in the preschoolers, the school age kids, families, seniors, uh, shut-ins, everyone. Uh, certainly um, get services from the library. It's been, I guess, about 20 years since the library's been built or, or longer. And I'd like to see that $150,000 put back in the CIP. Um, because uh, their situation, as far as wanting, is certainly different than the town. They have to do a lot of fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, they have various studies that have to be done, certainly not unique to, to their project. But they certainly have some elements there that are unique to them. And certainly fundraising, which is a, a large component of, of this project, uh, go to fundraisers and, you know, they really need to see that commitment from the past. It's not going to go into the operating budget, so we don't have to worry about the, uh, the tax rate this year. And the other part, part is the uh, part-time person. They wanted to make that person full time. Uh, I think that's a small cost. I think we got, what, nine ten thousand uh, dollars If you've ever been there, the, uh, when school gets out, it's like a, a daycare. Hmm. And they do a great job. They uh, keep the kids in line so other people can use the library and enjoy it. Uh, they have many programs, all these groups. Uh, I like to see the council that we consider that. Yeah, taking that hat off. 30 on seconds. Just kidding. <laughs> on these adjustments, these adjustments to the budget, looking at the school side, we have some, we've moved operational things over to the blind side. That's, that's like taking my, my home budget for next month, food, utilities, and so forth, and putting half of it on the credit card. You say, gee, I just reduced my, my, my operating budget by 50%. That's not a cut. That's not a reduction. Uh, coming back with adjustments on insurances, um, refinements on salary and benefits, um, those types of things are normal adjustments that take place all the time. I don't see, I don't see ten thousand dollars worth of adjustment on the school budget, and so we we tear the town apart. We look at look at the first responders and get out of them. Maybe agree the detail. Okay, we need we need the fire helmets, we need helmets, we need black jackets, and the school is getting a pass at this point. And I don't think that's right. Also, there's two thirds of the budget. And we, we seem to want to take a good, more than a third out of our side. And I can say, you show me where there's any kind of cut on your side. Thank you. Anybody else? Excuse me? No? Good day. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you, everyone. Thank you.